What I am going to highlight from here to the end of the message uh, comes from the book Walking in the Dust of Rabbi Jesus by Lois Tverberg. And here is where Jesus puts a twist on the answer of this teacher of the law and brings this transformative, powerful message. Jesus has already been teaching this. Uh, You've heard it said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy. This was quite a teaching from Jesus. And just a quick insertion note from history here is uh, the phrase, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, uh, was not a teaching that you will find in the Hebrew Scriptures. You may find some allusions to this, you know, some references in the Psalms, you know, and some of the laments and angst uh, David had with his enemies. I mean, you, But it was not a prominent teaching at all that you would uh, love your neighbor but hate your enemy. In fact, if you look at even the uh, rabbinic uh, teachings or the midrash of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the teachers of the law, you will also not find that phrasing. So where does it come from? Well, interestingly enough, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the 1940s, and it, these writings and compilations of teachings were uh, from a community called the Essenes, and they were around before Jesus' time. They were uh, hanging out as a, a, a community. Qumran community was probably the Essenes. Um, and some of the teachings that they had, this was a prominent teaching of theirs. Listen to this. Love all the sons of light, but hate the sons of darkness. Could it be that this is what Jesus is referring to when he says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor but hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemy. In this encounter with the teacher of the law, Jesus puts a twist on the command, and what he's actually doing is he is reminding this teacher of the law and the audience, right, and Luke is as well to his audience in his gospel, of the context of Leviticus 19. And Jesus is also going to employ, by telling the story of the Good Samaritan, the idea of the comparison of equals. Except it's not uh, the equal of sort of loving God and loving neighbor, that comparison of equals, that they really are one and the same command and the one reinforces the other, etc. But the comparison of equals that Jesus is making is between your neighbor and yourself. So listen to this. What's the big deal about this? Well, Jesus is pointing to the context. And let me read some more of the context from Leviticus 19, which Jesus knows because he's a student of the word, and so does this teacher of the law. This is what it says. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do you see here, it's a comparison of equals. You shall love the foreigner because they are like yourself. Now what's happening here is we are getting closer to the revolutionary, absolutely transformative teaching of Jesus by responding to this answer of the teacher of the law with the story of the Good Samaritan. We are to have empathy for our neighbor because they are just like us. So in context, again, of the command to love your neighbors yourself, quoted by the teacher of the law, which Jesus affirms, he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. So let me give you a couple of quick examples. When you are angry with your neighbor, don't forget, you're the same way. When you desire to strike out against your enemy or hold a grudge against them, where this command is quoted from, to love your neighbor like yourself, remember, you are the same way. You see, when we realize uh, that we are guilty of the same things that we want to accuse someone else of, we realize that we shouldn't bear a grudge against them. We should forgive them and love them instead because our neighbor is just like 
us. We need to love those who seem unworthy because we ourselves are unworthy. We all need God's mercy. This is absolutely transformative stuff. So think of it this way. When Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. By essentially saying in the prayer, teaching us to pray, please, Lord, love us even though we're sinners as we love other sinners who are just like us. Maybe that's a way to paraphrase it. To forgive others their sins is the greatest test of love. It's the first and greatest sign that we are followers of Jesus, that we belong to God and we have his heart. Because God must love us greatly if he keeps forgiving our sins that we commit against him. So last week, we highlighted the truth of this story. Uh, you couldn't miss it. It was a message on compassion. It was a beautiful picture of compassion. And the question um, that the teacher of the law asks is, who is my Rhea? Who is my neighbor? And if you approach the text last week from the angle of compassion, well, then the neighbor is the one who's stripped and beaten and, and left for half dead on the side of the road. That to show compassion to a neighbor, then the neighbor is the one on the side of the road in need. But Jesus turns this entire thing on his head when he asks after telling the story, who of the three was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? You see, the neighbor was the Samaritan. Now, isn't Jesus amazing? Love your neighbor as one who is like yourself. And the context reveals even more um, because chapter 10 is where our story of the Good Samaritan is. But in chapter 9, there's a story where the disciples are so angry with a Samaritan town because they treated Jesus rudely. They did not show hospitality. You've got to understand the Hebrews, the Jewish people, and the Samaritans were at odds about each other. They despised one another. They were rude to each other. And the disciples said this to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? They wanted to destroy the Samaritans. By Jesus telling this story using the Samaritan as the neighbor and knowing the context of Leviticus 19 and the teachings there about loving your neighbor who is like yourself, as well as the cultural animosity between Samaritans and the Jewish people of the day, especially the teacher of the law and probably the audience of the crowd that Jesus was teaching that day, what Jesus is saying is essentially this. Love the Samaritan. Love your neighbor Love the Samaritan who is your neighbor because he is just like you. So this gets even better if you can believe it. Um, remember I was telling you about Ray Vanderlaan who told me 10 years ago there's nothing that Jesus says that hasn't already been said before or doesn't have some allusion to the Hebrew scriptures. And you can bet Jesus knows um, the Old Testament scriptures, the Torah, the writings, uh, the prophets, uh, the wisdom literature, and so does this teacher of the law. And probably a, a large chunk uh, of the audience that was there in Jesus' day, or even the audience of the Gospel of Luke. And so um, there's an illusion of the story of the Good Samaritan to some things that occurred in Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 28. Now, you know that well-known book of Chronicles that we read all the time and we know all the history and stories of what's there, and I preach on it all the time, right? Second Chronicles 28? Well, you can bet that when Jesus started teaching about the story of the Good Samaritan, that they heard something else as well. In Chronicles 28, 
Israel and Judah, the people of God, right, that are divided into two nations at the time, are in battle after battle with one another. And they're just always fighting, trying to actually defeat one another. They each had their own kings, so to speak. Well, God allows Israel to defeat Judah because of its idolatry. All right? So, so think about that. Uh, Israel, God's people, God allows uh, them to conquer or win in battle over Judah, which is also God's people. And uh, the reason given there is because of their Judah's idolatry. So Israel is um, taking Judah back as slaves, and they're bringing them through the region and to the region of Samaria. And on their way, a prophet of God speaks words of God to the nation of Israel, who is taking them captive, Judah captive, reminding Israel that they too are guilty of idolatry. So what did Israel do? Well, they repented. They gave clothes to those who needed clothes. They gave food and drink to those who needed that. They gave oil for anointing and the bandaging of wounds. They gave the frail of Judah donkeys to ride on for a better travel. They brought them to Jericho where they gave them shelter. Is that some kind of coincidence that Jesus' story contains a Samaritan, as the neighbor, one who is like themselves. A Jericho road, the bandaging of wounds, the oil for healing, food and drink, a donkey ride, shelter. What is Jesus reminding his audience of? Well, it's this. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy, who is just like you. And now you know the rest of the story. This is the Word of God. Just another reminder for you, um, get a hold of Lord Grote's recently released book, uh, Live Wide Awake, um, Engaging God's Story and Embracing Yours. And uh, we're going to begin that next week already with chapter one. Uh, Laura's book will provide some thematic structure for our messages through the summer, and I'll be bringing scripture to it and stories, etc. So get a hold of that book. I have five or six copies that I ordered in advance. So if you need one or you'd like me to deliver one to you, give me a call. I will bring that to you. I've got about five to six left. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I am postponing a series that I had uh, in mind already last September. I was going to preach on the minor prophets this summer. Um, but just with some discernment, knowing what's all going on right now, I thought um, this might be a great way for us to stay together over the summer. So get a hold of that resource, um, and we'll move forward with that. But I'll tell you what, uh, the, the minor prophets and some of the teachings are still very much on my heart and thought as I've thought about a potential series Again, maybe next summer. So I just want to end today with a prayer uh, that comes from the words of the prophets. Uh, this comes from Amos, as well as a couple phrases from some other minor prophets. Let justice roll down like a mighty water, and righteousness flow like a never-ending stream. Let mercy resound like the waves on the ocean, and let praises rise up on the song of the redeemed. So there you go. Go love your neighbor in all these ways uh, that the prophets call us to. And uh, by way of the story of the Good Samaritan. Have a great week. Uh, we'll see you soon.